The first question is about uh, democracy. Uh, you said uh, in Journal Le Monde, the French newspaper, that you, you declare that you were reinventing democracy. Where are you now? Still reinventing. <laughs> um, we've made uh, quite a bit of progress along the lines uh, of the column that I wrote um, in Le Monde. Uh, for example, I said that I would like to um, expand the public commentary not just on one single case or um, one budget item or things like that, but rather on all the different projects that all the ministries are doing. And so this year, um, we have more than 1,300 um, different projects uh, by all the different ministries. Anything that is not state secret is now public on the internet for people to comment and for career public servants to answer in real time without the need of representatives. And I think that is a real um, progress because it used to be that it's only selected cases that a minister want to talk, mm -hmm. but now it's practically everything, right? So that's a, a good progress. Um, the other progress I would like to mention is that every ministry now has a team of what we call participation officers. That is to say, a team of people who are charged to engage with any petitioners or anything <clears throat> that are emergent from the civil society. And again, this is a regulation on the administration level, not answering to my office, but rather it is a part of the state system now, um, so that anything that is cross-ministry, previously they would just get an explanation, but now they will get a solution because those participation officers uh, will travel and meet the petitioners uh, in real time and with um, digitally assisted tools so that when people are cannot make it to rural places or remote islands, they can nevertheless participate in the face-to-face -face discussion. And I think the system uh, of which we have established more than 40 cases, like redesigning our online text filing system, like at the moment we're redesigning our Medicare um, experience and like very high impact things like that, but also local issues like um, local hospital coverage in Hangzhou in the south of Taiwan, a marine national park in Penghu, in Pescadora, and things like that. So it uh, encompasses all the different ranges. Uh, when I wrote that article, uh, I talked mostly about just digital economy yeah. issues. Yeah. But now uh, this system has been um, adopted by all the different issues, and of the 23 million people yeah. in Taiwan, 5 million is on our platform now. When I wrote that um, uh, article, maybe just uh, a few hundred K, right? but now 5 million. What are the biggest success and failures? If you have some failures. Yes. Uh, one of the biggest success <coughs> is that uh, we established uh, a sandbox system. Uh, what we mean by sandbox is an experimentation period where the civil society or the private sector can say our existing financial uh, regulation is in the way of innovation. But instead of fighting uh, in the parliament, they can say, I want a new revised regulation and I want to operate under this new system. So even the legal code itself is like open source, you can change it to a different direction. Yeah. And then you can experiment with this alternate version of the code uh, for one year uh, in a limited uh, risk environment. Uh, and of course there are some red lines, like you cannot say, for the next year I'm going to experiment with money laundering, or for the next year I'm going to experiment with funding some terrorists. Uh, that, that is not possible. <laughs> Otherwise, any regulation from any other ministry, you can also challenge in the sandbox application. And so we started this uh, platform economy uh, regulation in January this year, and we established a FinTech sandbox on April this year. And then at the end of the year, we expect to pass another, what we call uh, AI mobility sandbox, which talks about autonomous vehicles 
that can be、uh, you know a car that drives and then flies,、yeah. or a ship that sails and then becomes a car.、Uh, it could be hybrid、uh, between various modalities, and that can also be experimented for a year and extended to two years. And if it's a good idea, then our regulation change because of it. And if they, it requires a law change, then the experiment can be extended up to four years. Again, a longest、uh, period in anywhere in the world. So plus, bye、uh, bye for the next question.、Uh -huh. yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. I have them. Yeah. yeah fit, but, uh, I prefer I to have them in English. Yeah. yeah. I, I would also like to talk about failures. Yeah.、Um, yeah. So、um, there, there was a, a notable、um, shortcoming. Um, when we first did the Uber、uh, case in 2015,、uh, that was also very widely reported、uh, in French media,、yeah. uh, and so because of that, I would like to add something、uh, that I consider as shortcomings、um, in retrospect.、Uh, there are three shortcomings. First, when we did the consultation, Uber was only operating in Taipei City and New Taipei and maybe a little bit of Taoyuan, so in North Taiwan. It's like it's only operating in Paris, right?、Um, so because of that, the stakeholders、uh, we did in this、uh, consultation mechanism only included the labor unions, the taxi drivers, the existing taxi fleets operating in that region, and we did achieve consensus, and it was ratified, and now Uber is operating legally, and you can call taxi using Uber app, and so on. It's all very well done, but it did not include stakeholders in the southern、uh, part of Taiwan. Which Uber again started operating、uh, after our consultation. So it is、um, in retrospect,、um, the south part of Taiwan's taxi drivers' view is unfair, because it, it while its consensus is North Taiwan's consensus, <laughs> and somehow it becomes laws that, that affects them. So I think that is a, a major shortcoming.、Um, and the second thing is that when we did the consultation,、uh, we did not involve、uh, the pub career public servants. Um, mostly, we、uh, rely on the、um, volunteers from the zero community to run the system. So, what is very successful、uh, when the next minister want to run something like it and ask their、uh, staff to run it? They don't know how to run it at all because it was all done by outside experts.、Uh, and so,、um, we we are remedying this、uh, now by having. Participation officers to be all career public servants, so that this skill can accumulate within the public service instead of rely on outside experts. And so that was a shortcoming that we're we're trying to、um, em ameliorate now.、Uh, and now、uh, the third shortcoming is that during the discussion、uh, with Uber, there was a、um, uh, a voice、uh, that says we should generalize this. To、uh, sharing of parking lots,、uh, to Airbnb, to all the different platform economy cases, but at that time we felt that because we engage already with Ministry of Economy, Transportation, Finance, it's already a lot of stakeholders. If you want to talk about those other platform economy, we have to engage more people, and and it's very expensive, <laughs> both in time and in、uh, cost. So we we said no, we just focus on this particular case.、Uh, but unfortunately, that came back to bite us because <laughs> that there's many other cases with similar structure, right? So which is why, as I mentioned,、uh, this、uh, January we did a case of a general platform economy、um, regulation that that deals with platform economy in general. But in retrospect, if we had already done that in 2015, that would save three years of controversy. So those are the shortcomings of the first UberX consultation. If it's not too soon, what is today the legacy of、uh, the heritage of the sunflowers、mm -hmm. movement?、Uh, has it changed the, the Taiwanese society?、Uh, yes,、um, I think in the mayoral election following the sunflower movement,、uh, any mayor that speaks、uh, an authoritarian language that is、uh, against public transparency. Uh, lost the election, and there are some mayors who are sunflower、uh, supporters who did not expect to be elected.、Uh, nevertheless, got elected <laughs> just because they advocated for the sunflower values, and so because of that, that becomes part of the Taiwan identity、um, democracy in the sense that democracy is not just about voting. Every four years,、yeah. but about every day, we can see what is happening. And any major、uh, politician 
uh, at least have to pay lip service to this idea, otherwise they don't have a political career. And so I think that becomes a new norm uh, of politicians in Taiwan. Um, is it a coincidence if uh, all these projects for democracy, that the, the fact that you are pioneering uh, digital democracy, mm -hmm. emerge at the time where China threatens more and more openly the independence and mm -hmm. the identity of Taiwan? Well, I think um, the PRC is also advancing digital technology, uh, but perhaps toward a very different direction. Um, that is still innovation, but innovation in the name of authoritarian control. Um, so I would not say that they are not innovative. They are very innovative, just on um, very different <laughs> directions. And so because of their advance in such innovations, uh, I think it is natural uh, for them to try to influence uh, the nearby powers to adopt this philosophy of authoritarian control because it is the nature of many uh, states and governments to want authoritarian control and to curtail the space uh, for the civil society. It was just that there was no good technology to do that. And so whatever liberty the civil society enjoys at those jurisdictions, um, it may be an artifact of just there's no uh, power uh, structure that is enhanced by advanced digital surveillance technology. Right? So I would say the PRC is now actively exporting uh, this philosophy and the digital system that associates with this philosophy. And so I don't think this is particular about Taiwan, although we're innovating on a very different direction, but it is natural for a advanced uh, political and philosophical system to want to expand its influence and its philosophy to like-minded uh, jurisdictions. Hmm. Taiwan is creating its own Silicon Valley and wants to become the AI island of the world. Why? Hmm. So uh, our national plan is called Asia Dot Silicon Valley, and I want the dot that connects the Asia and the Silicon Valley. Uh, so um, I would not say that we're going to copy your Shanghai Silicon Valley. That is not our goal. Our goal is basically to uh, look at the common issues faced by the Asian region, uh, which is uh, very soon going to be the world's most populous region and suffers from the same climate, aging, and various other um, you know, sustainable development challenges. And so we're innovating in response to those social needs. And we solve not just our local issues, uh, like using AI to solve water leakage problem, uh, to solve water shortage issues as a result of climate change, but we're also exporting the AI technology we develop for resilience. For example, right now in New Zealand, a bunch of AI people from Taiwan and Taiwan Water Company are helping them uh, to solve the water shortage and leakage issue, which was not an issue because in New, New Zealand used, you know, didn't used to have a water shortage problem, but because of that climate change, right? So I think what I'm saying is that we're not saying Silicon Valley has all the answers. We're saying Silicon Valley has a set of tools like machine learning that we are part of uh, the creators of those tools. But those tools must be deployed to solve real social and environmental issues in Taiwan. And we're not just satisfied with uh, solving these locally, but also publicizing and sharing our results so that every other uh, people in the Asian region suffering from the same environmental and social issues can enjoy this innovation that we connect the Silicon Valley's power to. But it is a instrument, uh, the Silicon Valley technologies. It is not an end in itself. In Europe, from Plateau's cavern, we contrast virtual and real. Uh, in Taiwan, men still, they still have traditions. Mm. And, uh, for example, uh, the ancestral fish flying or stick tofu recipes are and, and they film it and put it on e-commerce sites <laughs> <laughs> and, and put virtual reality experiences of uh, flying fishing so it means that there is no two Taiwans a uh, big yeah. Taiwan or a real Taiwan there's no opposition between the two sides of the society yeah as President Tsai Ing-wen declared in her campaign uh, her campaign ideal is broadband as human right now many jurisdictions say this, but very few actually deliver 
Taiwan is one of the few places where we actually deliver broadband as a human right. Any place in Taiwan, if you cannot connect to broadband internet, is the government's fault. So because of this, um, we don't have, as you said, the digital gap between uh, the people who have access and the people who do not. Uh, everybody is entitled for, to broadband access, and even for poor families who cannot afford the tablets or the devices, they can go to their local library, their local digital opportunity center, or the local school uh, to enjoy such access. And so because of that, what we're saying is that it is not to Taiwan if we can include everyone in the digital transformation. And indeed, uh, in terms of the broadband readiness, Taiwan is like number one or number two in the world. You recently attended a meeting of uh, the UN, mm. um, as in Geneva, filmed by mm. robots. Mm. Uh, what does your virtual presence mean for you? I attended many meetings in the UN <laughs> this way. It's just that Geneva one was yeah. live streamed on the internet. Yeah. So okay. Chris okay. discovered I saw it was, you know, the first one. <laughs> and it's a, no, no it's, 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 it's something that uh, I've always been doing, even before becoming a digital minister. Okay. And I see this as first, it reduces carbon footprint compared to flying, and it also doesn't have jet lag um, <laughs> as a problem. So I think it's a very convenient way. <laughs> and uh, in Madrid, I actually um, appeared uh, first as a robot, they call it Galatia, uh, that is a 360 robot that I can experience Madrid using virtual reality. And after a week, I fly to Madrid, and the students there feel that I just change bodies <laughs> from a silicon one to a carbon one. <laughs> but it is a continuity uh, of relationship. And so I think telepresence is um, only going to be even more and more uh, feasible to bind people's feelings together and not just abstract words or images. And I think this uh, makes a lot of sense in a diplomatic setting as well because people need to feel how it is like uh, in various different corners of the world instead of seeing them just as abstract numbers. So I, I'm happy to demonstrate this, but I think this is not something that is a one-shot, it is an ongoing relationship. What are the most important influence of the destiny of humanity for you? The dialogue uh, of men between, with men, uh, mm -hmm. men with machines, mm -hmm. machines with machines, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh, what do you say? Well, the dialogue itself uh, is the, the important part, uh, right? We, we are, after all, just containers of thoughts. Uh, the ideas, the thoughts, they inhabit people who are ready for it and they also may inhabit machines that are ready for it. What I mean is a more relational uh, view on things. Uh, because I think at the moment many people, especially uh, in the Silicon Valley, see data as something that is an asset, that's something that can be hoarded, something can be owned, can be sold, can be given, and so on. And so they see data exchange as a proxy of a dialogue. And I think this is a dangerous view. I think data is just a beginning of a relationship. If I have some data that I create with you, then we talk about how to make use of the data together. If you have some data that you entrust to me, uh, we begin a relationship in which that you can uh, ask me about what am I doing with the data, about updating, about uh, turning the data into something that is more accurately reflecting your um, in the moment um, state and not some state four years ago or ten years ago mm -hmm. and so so on and so I think this uh, accountability mechanism uh, while very abstract if you read the GDPR it is actually very humane it, it, it talks about the agency that each actor each person or each machine in the future um, has if they have a beginning of a relationship with any other entity it is the agency of the data expression and the uh, data as a social object that enables such in, uh, reactions and actions and relationships. And so taken in this view, I think what is important is that it must be uh, uh, equitable and symmetric. If we have a relationship that only I can talk and you cannot, it is not a relationship, it is just control. Right. So what is important is the equitable and symmetric relationship um, 
of all the stakeholders involved, and I think that is the important part. It doesn't quite matter uh, how many of these are men or women or transgender or machines, but rather uh, the importance is how equitable the message flows between the different nodes. Reinventing democracy, strengthening individual freedoms, including LGBT rights, Taiwan's identity and specificity has been strengthened in recent years. However, the island seems isolated mm -hmm. on the international, uh, international scenes, right? How do you see and um, resist to this paradox? Well, the island is pretty stable. I mean, we had some earthquakes, but we were generally doing fine. Uh, and uh, the influx of tourists have not stopped. Um, it actually increased. Um, but of course, the demographics have changed uh, slightly. But I would not say that we're being isolated. There's more people coming to Taiwan and also coming from Taiwan to other places. And the international trade and exchange of information and knowledge and innovation, they have not stopped, right? So I think this is entirely uh, in the mind of um, the, the frame of Taiwan. If you see Taiwan as a island with huge biodiversity, with the peoples, with huge social diversity as well, and as you said, the identity of us as a, you know, uh, island where diverse values can still c find common solutions uh, to everyone. This value have not changed and indeed have only strengthened and uh, our influence uh, to the region and to the world has on only increased during the, the uh, recent years. Um, but if you talk about um, isolation, then that is taking a very uh, Westphalian uh, view on things. So maybe only on the Westphalian arena uh, <laughs> does this description <laughs> make, make sense. Yeah. But as a anarchist, I officially don't care. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so, so that, that's my personal uh, answer. <laughs> <to this question. laughs> Last question. As a child, you drew computers before you even own one. Mm. What remains of the dream and hopes mm. you had? Right. So, well, I can still draw a keyboard for you here, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, still, it's still here. So, um, yeah, I, I always um, prefer um, stylus uh, from Tom Pilot um, to Zoris uh, to um, Note um, phone to uh, the Apple Pencil. Um, the, this, I think, is the same uh, from the age when I was um, eight years old when I started drawing keyboard with a uh, pencil. I always uh, preferred input modalities that uh, makes the full use or the fuller use of body. Right, so it could be gestures, it could be images, it could be <clears throat> the high quality recording like talking to the camera. But uh, in other words, I think uh, computers as a, what Steve Jobs said, a bicycle of the mind. Um, it carries the entirety of the mind and the body uh, that associate with, with the mind. This embodied uh, computation and computer as a bicycle that carries us, but ultimately we steer it and we pedal it. <clears throat> I think this is uh, the same image, uh, the same conception I had as, I, as a child, and at that I'm still applying this, this as a lesson today as the digital minister. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you very much. No more questions. Thank you. That was very good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Merci. Thank you. 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 Thank you.